Hello, audience. You're inside my head again. What's in there this week? Jokes. Modern art is full of them. I had a friend who was a clown. When he died, all his friends came to his funeral in one car. You know, I was up there in prison uh, talking to Charlie Manson, and he says to me, uh, is it hot in here or am I crazy? How can you tell your wife is dead? The sex is the same, but the dishes start piling up. <laughs> Here's a quick history of modern art jokes on idiot cards I've just drawn up. It's like a joke CD-ROM. You can cross-reference names, gags and meanings and download key illustrations. Number one, No Skill Needed Jokes by Marcel Duchamp. Number two, Everyone After Duchamp. No Skill Needed Either Jokes. Three, armpit jokes, and all the other bodily bits and butts. Number four, no problem jokes, no problem with high and low. Number five, a dumb joke, paint words instead of pictures. Then add a picture anyway, that's number six. Number seven, joke meisters, control freak jokes. Number eight, the ism joke, all the isms, piling up and running out and coming back as parodies. And finally, number nine, the annoying ending, the baffling missing punchline of modern art jokes. Marcel Duchamp, ironic, laconic, sardonic, wry, dry, a bit austere, a bit erotic, a cool French guy, never disturbed, always amused, always ready with a sardonic joke. And this programme is about modern art jokes, the stream of black off humour that runs through the art of the 20th century that drives people nuts from Duchamp to now. Modern art jokes, they're not all that funny, but they are big. And this is the biggest one of all, the unofficial icon of the Turner Prize. Fountain is an ordinary old urinal, bought in a shop, signed R. Mutt, sent to a big exhibition in New York in 1917, rejected, thrown away, then the next day, raised from the dead and preserved forever in the minds of conservatives as the arch icon of the great Satan of modern art, Marcel Duchamp. It was really, really trying to kill the artist as a, as a little god by himself. It rests here safely, like the meter rule, the measure of all irony, in the hidden vaults of the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the strong walls protecting an unsuspecting public from its full ironic blast. Blankness, indifference, contempt, that's the message of Duchamp's look as he poses for a screen test for Andy Warhol. Warhol, the artist who said he wanted to be a machine, to have no feelings, to be a kind of robot of art, filming Duchamp, the artist who said anything could be art, so long as an artist said it was.
irony is at the heart of Duchamp's output, nearly all of which is preserved today in the Modern Art Museum in Philadelphia, outside tomb-like, but inside like Pharaoh's treasures, filled with light and dazzling advanced abstract and figurative modern art hits. furthest chamber, like a nugget of art kryptonite radiating negativity vibes, is the Duchamp oeuvre. In the Philadelphia Museum of Art is a collection of paintings and objects by a man whose unique view of life has greatly influenced modern art. So here you are, Marcel, looking at your big glass. Yes. And the more I look at it, the more I like it. The main thing Duchamp did was his series of ready-mades. They were ready-made because he just bought them from a factory or a shop, and then he called them art. It was just a gag at first, then it became a line of works, and then a world-shattering paradigm shift. They weren't from the art world, they were from the opposite world, where artiness was supposed to not exist, the industrial world, the world of mass production. My idea was to choose an object that wouldn't attract me, either by its beauty or by its ugliness, to find a point of indifference in my looking at it, you see. Duchamp first thought that anything can be art in 1913, whether or not it's great philosophy, it's definitely the light bulb of avant-gardism first flickering on. The first moment avant-gardism became an aim in itself, something to be pursued not alongside quality, but absolutely instead of quality. Most of us kind of think art is quality. It's the next step up, the highest that quality can get. But with Duchamp, quality suddenly has a whole new meaning, one that is infinitely movable which is a strange idea for quality because we assume it's something that always stays the same. So basically, Duchamp is responsible for the fact that no one really knows what quality is in modern art. And a lot of modern art jokes are about the loss of it. What's lost in post-Duchampian artworks like this is any way of telling where the quality is. Sarah Lucas's cast of her own finger, giving the finger to the world. Or this old shelving unit, inexplicably titled after the philosopher Wittgenstein. Or this shiny toilet. It was Duchamp that made all this possible. Duchamp said the first thing his art was about was that it should amuse him. But the next thing was that it shouldn't be about what everybody else thinks are the most fundamental basics of art, the artist's eye and the skill of the artist's hand. Duchamp thought there was something else that was just as important, maybe more. Every artist, or even Velasquez, you see, I mean, there's no... There's something which belongs to, to the, to the hand, not to the mind. And I thought, probably at that time, that using a bit of the mind wouldn't be bad. Well, I think he was interested in trying to understand the art around him, the art before him, and, and that his way of understanding it was to test it. Duchamp's message was that art was congested in a certain way, in a painting and sculpture way, and he wanted to decongest it, so it could be not just painting and sculpture, but anything it needed to be. Duchamp's ready-mades look good now. They look sculpturally elegant, and they have poetic titles. When he was asked in the 1960s, just before he died, why, when he wanted to destroy art, his ready-mades now appeared so aesthetic, so much like art, he replied with the quip, well, nobody's perfect. He was such an extraordinary person, with a kind of aura around him. Well, he's an artist, other artists 
not follow in order to uh, to repeat what he's done not at all that but it's just his way uh, his observance of life was such that you would feel f you felt free within it to do your thing hey western civilization artists deserve the fame of rock stars let's begin with me That's a quote from one of the word paintings of the New York conceptual artist, Sean Landers. It's a joke. Here we are at the center of world joke art. We've speeded forward to nowadays in a joke spaceship. Artists can be big stars here and sell their art for a lot of money. And that's what this one has done. But instead of being a big ego monster, Sean Landers tries to be the opposite. As abject and gormless and unformidable and generally teenage as he possibly can be, without actually falling over. His paintings of words are diaristic ventings that record every passing blip of random thought throughout the day. It's a strand of Duchamp's conceptualism gone wild. I care about my art audience very much. Now stand the hell back, you're breathing on my painting. When Duchamp said that anything could be art, so long as an artist said so, he kicked off a whole culture of art about art, of art that questions the meaning of art. We're all used to that now. But is this questioning something that can only happen in an atmosphere that's high-minded and rarefied? What if it smells? What if it's adolescent and slacker and grungy? One of the bits of writing on that painting says that uh, critics think you're just acting dumb and innocent. Do you think you are just acting? Um, I think I probably uh, write in character, but sometimes more than others. Sometimes I feel I'm probably pretty genuine, and if what I happen to write is dumb, then it's dumb. This is preposterous. This Landers is an outrage. Does he expect us to take him seriously? And then, but if other times I think I am acting, just a little bit because I know it's, you know, comedic value. Not only does he mock modernism, but he also writes his mindless drivel all over each of his abominations. I'll sit in the chair staring off into space. Because it's just, it, the, the, the thoughts are sometimes so banal, it is like just sitting down and spacing out. Necessity is the mother of invention. The wheel was not invented by a thinker. It was a hungry caveman who wanted to bring the woolly mammoth home for dinner. Art nowadays is full of texts. Text art is usually boring. Landers is usually quite funny. That's why I like it. Sometimes it just seems by the by that it's art at all. His texts aren't grim, philosophical, clever, clever, but completely normal. The normal thoughts anyone might have if they weren't self-consciously trying to make themselves seem clever to an audience of art suits. But the twist to this gag is that Landers actually is quite self-conscious. Let's look in Sean's head now. Part of him is a grown man. Part of him is arrested at a floppy, gormless stage. One part looks at the other, draws from it, makes a form from it. The floppy part flops out spontaneity. The grown part hones and crafts and perfects the material. It's a dialectic between one and the other, but you can't tell which is which. What stage are these paintings at? Because from what you've been saying, there doesn't seem any need to take them any further, since they certainly conform to, well, that's enough. Or actually, are you thinking um, that they've, there's quite a lot of crafting and honing? And... There's not very much crafting and honing. It's, it's simply getting the image up there pretty quickly. Although none of these paintings are more than 50% finished at this point. So uh. if I throw a shadow, that pushes a wall back. And then when my words go up, they seem to be floating rather than just stuck on a thing. But that's, uh, 
a really unimportant sort of just aesthetic little thing that I do. Well, although actually that suggests a level of craft, which isn't necessarily where a, slight level a traditional art school teacher would look for it. But in terms of your act, there's certainly craft and, and structure and organisation to make the thing work in some way. There's a mild amount. <laughs> it's not too much. See, I wanted to paint pictures, but I wasn't that great at it, so I decided to write on them to make them better. And check it out, it worked. So where are we now? Artistic ego, bad, says Duchamp, so kill it with irony. Kick off a century of conceptualism. No need to be so dry all the time, says Landers. But even joke art has to work hard. It has to be saying something, something that sounds right as well as funny. It can't just be throwaway. So that's where we're going next, laughing in the face of conceptualism. A uh, horse walks into a bar. The bartender asks, hey, buddy, why the long face? That was another joke read out by the artist Richard Prince. It's a play on words. There are visual gags and word gags. Artists who make art gags use both. The idea, the image, they must never fit. They must just grate together, making art sparks. That was the system of René Magritte, the most popular surrealist ever, next to Salvador Dali. Magritte, artist of the bowler hat and the pipe that wasn't one. In his old home movies of the 1950s, recording nothing but whimsical nonsense, he looks like he's miming the meanings of his famous art, art that turned meaning upside down. Like an old Kingsley Amis he looks, with his pals in the Belgian suburb where they all lived, eating suggestive Freudian bananas like there was no tomorrow, and running the shots backwards like there was no reason. The old devil, wicked and negative and sceptical and philosophical, a bit world-weary, but definitely not arty or deep or intellectual. Definitely not nice. Welcome to the René Magritte exhibition. Oh, that's good. A museum guide, my favourite. Magritte many times said that his work was a systematic search for the startling poetic effects that could be achieved by dislocating everyday objects from the context of reality. Magritte's joke is the joke of the wrong label. The wrong word for the image, the wrong thought for the word. The wrong feeling for the thought. Magritte is popular because everyone knows his style is old style, but actually nothing like it exists in traditional art. It's a sign style, flat, not like pre-modern art, but like old posters for Pano or British Rail. The point of it is to make a point, not to draw attention to itself as a style. But it is beautiful in a way. It makes you stare. The economy of it, the ingenious picking out of outlines, making silhouettes expressive. Are they raining down or floating up, these suburban guys in their office uniforms that no one under 30 has ever seen in real life, only in Magritte? These interruptions to the smooth flow of meaning in Magritte's jokes depend on deadpan delivery. Everything must be absolutely straight in a world of wonkiness. The look of Magritte's paintings is the look of ladybird books, the ladybird book of phenomenology, perhaps. What would it say? Maybe, we have pictures in our heads for everything we see. They're signs that guide us round the visual world. What Magritte says is, what happens when you paint only those signs, not the things they refer to, and make the signs tell lies? Ugh, that would be horrible. Magritte's jokes don't just stop there. When he was offered his first one-man exhibition in Paris in 1948, when he'd already been well-known for 20 years, he responded with a show that was all insult. Hey, patronising French guys, he seemed to be saying with it. 
You think my art is only jokes. But maybe this is one you haven't heard before. If time ran backwards, his so-called Vash or dumb cow style would be Magritte's version of Sean Landers, a dumbing down to the point of idiocy. Where the very surfaces seemed to be sneering in classic Magritte, now they were throwing buns and popping zits like it was Animal House instead of modern art. That was Magritte letting rip in Belgium in the 1940s. What happens when you let rip here? Cologne, center of the German art market in the 1980s. The decade when German art was at the top of the international art tree. It's our next stop on the Jokes Tour. The mood, defiant, relentless. And nuts. These are the qualities that make the art Martin Kippenberger. When I think of Kippenberger, I think of a stream of deliberately ugly objects and images, full of commentary on the world, but without the commentary being particularly understandable, like this 1980s sculpture, a found object in the Duchamp tradition on a plinth. But the object is a 1970s glam rock high heel boot, and the plinth is made of foam rubber with a carpet. It's called Coal Mine 2. Why? I don't know. He produced a lot of writings that don't have any answers either, like a book of thoughts called No Problem. We don't have problems with the Rolling Stones. One thought went inexplicably, because we buy their guitars. There are other entries on such modern life subjects as chocolate mousse, politics, alcoholism. We get drunk, we fall down, no problem. Or, as this painting says, we don't have problems with people who look exactly like us because they get our pain. Doodle hoodle. We don't have problems with mozzarella and basilicum because we pay back with mousse au chocolat. We don't have problems with women because they know why. Kippenberger was one of the most successful artists of the 80s. I always thought he was incredibly modern and realistic. His subjects were the ugly objects of ordinary life. They went with the baby talk and nonsense slogans that he churned out, and his records with lyrics that go ya 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 or The yuppie doo theme, it's like the theme from 2001. What is reality, it asks. We don't know what reality is, but we do know it's full of stuff that doesn't work. War bad, he says, only it's Father Christmas saying it. Nice communist girl is the slogan for this picture, painted when the Berlin Wall was still standing. This is the Chelsea Hotel in Cologne. I sometimes met Kippenberger here, but I never knew what to say to him. I never found his jokes all that funny, but I always wanted more. I was an addict. Why was that? He'd be drinking if it was the evening, or if it was the morning, he'd be recovering, the artist of the perpetual hangover, staring at his breakfast and inventing egg symbols out of his head. For Max and Helmut Kohl, the fixer, einmal den Doppelknocker Harris with Salamander. Traditionally, eggs in art symbolise potential, birth and rebirth. But what was Kippenberger hatching with his endless eggs? Was he just rebirthing more bad-smelling jokes? 
No, his art was very serious. I mean, it was not a, not, it was not a joke at all. Um, he just used jokes, you know. It was one form of uh, presenting one part of his art. He knew that a lot of people didn't get it, but he was hoping uh, that they would get it with time. That's called German Egg Banger. That's a really ugly title. And that's a really ugly picture, and an ugly use of pain. But actually, it's quite good. When you think about a student in the first year at art school trying to be ugly uh, for its own sake, you know, I hate the world. It's all much more one-dimensional, much more anal, much more repressed than anything you find in Kippenberger. You don't get that confidence scale, that fluency of marks, unexpected colours. You don't get the consistency of ideas and imagery that you get in Kippenberger that runs through all his work and the consistency of themes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eggs for breakfast, pasta for dinner, society's needs. You learn to follow these silly but resonant gags. We can't feed the world, but we can come up with tomato and mozzarella salad and anachronistic theme park tourist spots. Kippenberger's fast gag art was about public subjects, not private obsessions. His last work is a public sculpture. It's a subway entrance tipped up on end. You can only walk up these steps unsteadily, and you can only unravel these joke symbols with difficulty. The tortured soul of the artist, the boring old public transport system, and its place in the social infrastructure. Kippenberger was annoying to the public because he wasn't afraid to look at annoying things, like Germany's annoyance with itself for having an embarrassing past. He once bought a gas station in Brazil, traditional hiding place for Nazi war criminals, just to have the answering machine play back the message, hello, Martin Bormann gas station here. It was supposed to disturb people. It was not simply a joke. It had many sides to it. Uh, he could sort of look at himself, tell jokes to people until they were so bored that they left the room. We don't have problems with friends. We sleep with them. We don't have problems with men. We are real gay boys. We don't have problems with the Guggenheim because we can't say no if we're not invited. Kippenberger's jokes came to an end in 1997 when he died from liver failure caused by alcoholism. Is he laughing now at his forest of birch trees, the forest of signs maybe, and his giant wooden aspirins, maybe for the problem in his head after all the camparas he had for breakfast? Let's leave Kippenberger alone now in art joke heaven, remembering the melancholic title he gave to this artwork. I'm going for a walk in the Birchwood. My pills will be taking effect soon. An elderly man, uh, hard of hearing, is joined by his wife as the doctor makes an exam. Finally, the doctor says, I'm mystified. I need to do further tests. So leave me urine, feces, and sperm samples. The gentleman asks, what did he say? What does he want? His wife responds, leave him your underwear. That was a rather cruel joke. So is this one. This is Albany in upstate New York, the home of Richard Prince, an art superstar of the 80s, the American equivalent of Martin Kippenberger. He presented photos of Marlboro ads as his own art. It was appropriation art. It was funny, but not really a joke. But another thing he appropriated was actually the common joke. First joke I, I wrote was I went to a psychiatrist. He sold his first joke for $50, but then doubled the price with each subsequent sale. He said, Soon he was making good money, as well as travestying the art market's value system. 
thing. I did, and I wrote it out uh, in the middle of the paper. And I um, went to a psychiatrist. He said, tell me everything I did, and now he's doing my act. And then I um, would sign it. Are you funny? Do you think of yourself as particularly hilarious? No, that's what's sort of strange um, in terms of using jokes as a subject matter. I've never really thought that I had a sense of humor, and I, I'm very bad at telling jokes. I find that uh, most jokes are fairly tragic. I think pain is probably fairly elemental in a joke. As soon as he started painting jokes instead of just writing them out, the meaning started wobbling, as if paints and brushes and canvases were part of the joke. No, it was never a joke about the medium of painting. I mean, the jokes were essentially just subject matter, and I decided really not to paint them at first. I decided to silkscreen them. So basically, I reset the jokes in Helvetica Bowl type and had them made into silk screens. For me, it was an extremely abstract painting. Did you think it was art when you did it? I did in the sense that if I had seen someone else do it, if I had walked into a gallery or something and seen it on a wall, I would have been very jealous. What does it say? Uh, I went down to Miami. They told me I'd get her a lovely room for $7 a week. The room was in Savannah, Georgia. It's being more jarring than funny, exactly, that makes Prince's jokes good as art. At the simplest, they're at their best. The jokes of the 80s. I like Kippenberger's jokes because if he was a stand-up, his act would be called the Pain and Embarrassment Review. The sad portraits of the suburban psychological landscape that come out of this studio are the American version, the Hatred and Disappointment Show. I accidentally shot my mother-in-law while deer hunting. It was an honest mistake. I came out of the tent in the morning and thought I saw a deer in an orange vest making coffee. Welcome back. It's a film about jokes. We should be all smiles, but we're all grim and moody instead because it's modern art jokes. We're back in the 90s, but to get the 90s, you have to look at the 60s. What was underground then is the mainstream now. Duchamp elevated jokes to art, but Piero Manzoni, who was an artist of the early 60s, elevated them even further to the realm of the spirit. A plinth that says it's an upside-down plinth with the world on top. That's a good joke. Single, mysteriously long lines drawn on paper, rolled up in little cylinders, a joke on drawing. Some hard-boiled eggs signed with the artist's thumbprint. Manzoni's signature was his magic medium. With it, he could turn balloons filled with his breath into saintly relics, or make women into artworks. It was just a flourish of his big felt pen that transformed them. Nowadays, all this is complicated because we're not sure women should be made into art, in case it's just making them into objects, which we know they don't like. What about capturing a live test case who really did get the signing treatment from Manzoni? Maybe we could book her on a hastily convened modern art chat show. What was it like being signed by Manzoni as an artwork? It was like being used by the artist. And uh, the artist used me as his material. Did you think it was significant or silly? No, it was uh, very significant and not silly. And in fact, uh, he gave me a certificate, which I show you. And this certificate has the red stamp was put on the Certificate of Works of Art. So you only work of art during the day? Or... Always. And when you're a work of art, do you have any special duties? None. But uh, I am a kind of prisoner of his idea. Manzoni died in 1963 from heart failure when he was only 29. He was deep and his jokes were poignant, and I always liked the way he made fatness look good in photographs. On the other hand, his most famous work was a pile of shit. Everyone knows shit is shocking, and we don't want to see it. So obviously, there's probably a lot of it in modern art. These are the cans of his own shit that Piero Manzoni produced in 1961. 
You can read the title on the labels in four different languages. Mer d'artiste, Merde d'artista, Künstlerscheiß, Artist shit. Each one individually signed. When he first sold them, they cost their weight in gold. Now they're worth much more. Now they would cost, if they came on the market, around 30,000 pounds a can. So this is nearly a million pounds worth of the shit of an artist. Money, shit, art, the Holy Trinity. Manzoni in Italy, transubstantiating shit into art. Five years later, the situationists in Paris turned jokes into politics. It was the revolution of everyday life. The situationists believed in an evil called the Society of the Spectacle. It was an evil that they thought could only be countered by jokes, situationist jokes. They took the imagery of capitalism and infected it with situationism. They couldn't care less about art. It was reality they were interested in. They thought it was in the streets, not in art galleries. There was an element of terrorism to situationism that made it quite effective at getting intellectual ideas across to a big audience. Even though now, situationism seems incredibly obscure. The situationists went on pointless walks to challenge the society of the spectacle, which they called deriving. And they scrambled the meanings of the spectacle by detournement. They detourned the words of comic strip thought balloons by writing in their own words instead, or the words of Chairman Mao. And they had their own slogans or rallying cries, which seemed to make sense at the time, but which now nobody could understand. Beneath the paving stones, the beach, they cry. Hey, I'm dereaving now, daydreaming in the Paris traffic about a lost world, trying to put a joke back together again that everyone has forgotten about. Situationism was about saying everything should be a revolution instead of a sham. No more consumerism, no more state politics, uh, small workers' councils instead. As far as I remember, Renault factory workers thought something like that too. So for a brief heady time that middle-class liberal parents will never leave off going on about, workers and polo neck students united against the fuzz. But then they all had their heads cracked in. The May 68 demos took place against a backdrop of posters in the Paris streets showing situationist slogans. By the end of the year, the workers were back in the factories and the posters were in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The situationist leader was the writer Guy Debord, charismatic and dictatorial and always excommunicating members of the movement. Convinced the CIA were bugging his flat, Debord committed suicide in 1994. What Guy Debord got right was that in the future our lives really would be absolutely ruled by the mass media, but what he didn't predict was how much we'd all really like it. So was situationism serious or rubbish? Pretty much rubbish. Situationism was a revolution that never happened. The Fluxus movement, based in New York, didn't have any political aims at all. The problem of the 60s was everybody being too uptight, the Fluxus artists said. The solution was to lighten up. Fluxus took bits of life and gave the bits unlikely structures, so they became mini theatrical events. Event was a buzzword. They had events for everything. Clothes events, food events, water events. The leader of the movement was George McCunis. He was a kind of joke dictator, fanatically controlling every detail of Fluxus activities. McCunis died in 1978. This is the last object he ever made. You could almost imagine there's a little man in there. Hey, there is. Taking a long time to get out. It's Jonas Mikas, 
the underground filmmaker, the unofficial guardian of the flux of spirit, which frankly is a spirit of silliness. Humor uh, was not very one like ha 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 ha. It was a very light, ephemeral uh, kind of humor. Right, it wasn't a belly laugh. No, not a belly laugh. Fluxus had members from all over the world, including Yoko Ono, who made a Fluxus film of bottoms. Did she really break up the Beatles? Maybe we'll never know. But that's the kind of empty, random thought stream that Fluxus films seem to inspire. The mind zoning out on images of a toilet flushing, or a TV screen gradually going fuzzy. I think probably it was some reaction against too, being too serious, serious, great art, the art, that there was a need for like opening, relaxation, not being so serious, make fool out of yourself. The Fluxus movement lasted a long time. It was 15 or 16 years of ephemera. Ephemeral objects, ephemeral statements, ephemeral events. It's amazing that a movement so daft should have had such an impact. But the Fluxus moment is a major step in the genealogy of Joe Carr. For one thing, it contains the seeds of young British art of the 90s, for example, Sarah Lucas, mistress of the rude banana, the demon child of Fluxus and Carry On films, with Kippenberger as the midwife. The rude, the hairy, that's Lucas's joke domain, and the double entendre. These double fried eggs are cooked up each morning and carefully positioned on a table by gallery assistants, along with a gruesome congealed kebab. Is it a protest against brute man's sex fantasies? Or is it a plea that says, more filth in sex, please, I'm British? Lucas can make art out of rubbish in the 90s because of the open door policy to rubbish that Fluxus initiated in the 60s, with the door opened for them by Marcel Duchamp in 1917. Jokes in art after Duchamp often seem like they don't move on from Duchamp's ready-mades very much. He sets something in motion, others follow, and others follow the others. The jokes get more and more groaning. How much can the world groan and still ask for more? Lots, it turns out. The Young Turks of Young British Art are sometimes criticised for only recycling previous art, not thinking up anything new. Gavin Turk's self-portrait looks like Andy Warhol's famous last self-portraits, and its title, A Man Like Mr Kurtz, is from Apocalypse Now. Oh, why do we have to bother with this, art critics sometimes say. It's all a pile-up of recycled art, parody piled upon parody. But are the critics always right? No, I say. Yes, it's old paintings from neoclassicism, and joke eggheads from Magritte and Manzoni's boiled eggs, all reverberating away like echoes in an ever-narrowing tunnel. But no, it's not just a compost of stale art jokes. Something fresh emerges. What is this made of? So it's made of wax, and um, the reason why I've made it of wax, as opposed to any other synthetic material, is because I wanted the sculpture to refer to something you might see in Madame Tussauds. It immediately um, has got something to do with a touristic appreciation of London. It has that notion of familiarity and populism. So the sculpture isn't actually finished yet. Of course, there's quite a lot still to do with it. I mean, I've got to, um, like, stick the eye in and stuff like that. And I've got... Um, I've got... Oops. I've got the, um, I've got all the beard. I've actually got my own beard that I'm going to transpose into the chin of the mannequin here. The guy, in many ways, relates to a sort of decrepit version of myself, or should I say a decrepit version of another sculpture which I've made, which is actually of me, which is a sculpture called Pop. 
it's a, a likeness of me that's been slightly modified so I'm behaving or have the appearance and have the clothes on of Sid Vicious from the Sex Pistols. Do you think that art is kind of funny as well as all sorts of other things or funny never comes into it or it's primarily funny or...? I think that life is funny. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm continually... Um, I'm continually brought round to um, to sort of fits of giggles just by the thought of it actually being alive, in a way, by the sort of fluke of it. And um, and I think that art should reflect that. Gavin Turk. Thunder cracking, storm clouds gathering. Have we really faced the final curtain, the end of art? Duchamp's ready-mades with no skill, what a joke. We couldn't let it lie, could we? It was such a devastating one-liner. Where can you go after that? No wonder he said he had given up art and was just going to play chess instead. But actually, Duchamp never gave up making artworks. He just did it in secret. And although they were strange and unclear, they strangely were full of evidence of the artist's hand, the accuracy of his eye, the quality of his design and workmanship, all those old taboos. And here comes his last work. And what do we find? A disgusting, tasteless, anti-woman joke or a mysteriously beautiful dream symbol? No one was allowed to look at this. Uh, while Duchamp was alive. I'm looking at it now over 30 years after he died. No one knows what it means, but we know where uh, some of the things came from. The twigs are from the same place that the old door comes from. The hand is from a cast of teeny Duchamp's hand. The bricks are from round where he used to live. He'd go out as an old man with his wife of that time, Teeny Duchamp, pick up bricks from building sites and take them back to the flat. The waterfall, the glinting effect on it is made by a little bit of homemade machinery behind the scenes, which apparently is very amateurishly put together, but which still runs OK now, 30 years later. The whole effect is kind of macabre, but also fairy tale, enchanting, dreamlike. It's kind of uh, hard to describe, really. It's not horrible and it's not sweet, but it is a mixture of the two. What was that magic light in Duchamp? What was it showing? Was it the lamp of creativity never going out? Or just the sickly green light of culture's last meltdown. Fountain, boldly back where we began. Is it like the monolith in 2001? Is everything modern made in its image? The asteroid of irony hurtling through art space. In it, we convince ourselves we see the problem in our modern heads of culture nowadays just being empty or terminally frivolous. Personally, I like Duchamp's seriousness and the seriousness of all the artists we're now closing the door on. I think it's seriousness that makes them artists. And that's why, when they're just telling jokes, because that's when they really are only playing, it's always a bit crap. Did you hear the one about the, the guy that had a bit of a drugs problem? He took some uh, Indian spices uh, up his nose and uh, fell into a coma. <laughs>